Okay, good morning. The nice thing about this session is I think in many respects a lot of these talks are to get you to think a little differently. That is certainly what this talk is about. Um, I think when you reflect back on medical education or your continuing education, probably 98% of it falls into the category of comparative effectiveness. That is evaluating um, the valuing um, clinical outcomes in and of themselves. This talk specifically is looking at it in a little bit broader context of the value of what you deliver. That is how much money you're investing for the outcomes you're achieving. I have an administrative role in my own hospital and have to, in many respects, you know, uh, to some degree, Brendan phrased this talk in a little bit more of a cynical way of you know, how to save money, and in many respects that is, and it's fairly painful, some of the managerial decisions on this. But I hope we'll provide you some of that perspective um, from an administrative standpoint as well. So the purpose is to provide a little bit of background on this, um, some of the data around what are the current economic challenges in our field, um, show you a little bit about <laughs> cost benefit and cost effectiveness financial modeling and how they might apply to your practices broadly, um, or specifically with some examples in obstetric anesthesia. Um, when you look at our healthcare system, you could actually put it in the context that it sits frankly between France and Germany in terms of overall economic, uh, size of an economic enterprise. This is our, the U.S. healthcare system is bigger than almost every country on earth. In fact, um, one aspect of our government, uh, this Health and Human Services or the Center for Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Studies, um, is a bureaucratic enterprise that uh, has 77,000 people working for it and in itself is the 14th largest economy in the world. Um, and by the way, as an interesting aside, do you know who this is? Anybody know? Very few people know who this is. Is this, is this enterprise, the 14th largest economic enterprise on earth, run by an elected official? No, an appointed official. This is Sylvia Burwell. She is a woman who is my age, who is in charge of the 14 largest economy. She was not elected. Fortunately, she's quite able, but she's running this. And by the way, Many people view, and certainly my former boss who worked um, as a senior healthcare advisor in the West Wing for a year, and it was one of the most fascinating years of my life to work for him and hear all the stories from the inside, views a lot of healthcare reform is over within government. The 50-yard line is uh, the payers right now, and many of the payers are following the lead of this organization and this woman, so there's a reason to pay attention to it. And uh, as an aside, that individual quickly left as chief medical officer at our institution and took chief strategist at Blue Cross, the 50-yard line. So where do we stand in terms of healthcare costs? The, for us, most of the decision-making in healthcare and anesthesia has really been around, does something work better? We have not had to face the tough decisions that we're now facing in that, does it work better and is it cost-effective? Why? Well, we're substantially out of line from the rest of the world in terms of how we spend our dollars uh, in healthcare. And in fact, a lot of our ratings in world um, healthcare, we always find ourselves a little surprised to see that the U.S. healthcare system is ranked so much lower than others. And we think a lot of what we deliver is really the best in the world. A lot of our ranking and our ranking um, drop really comes from the poor value we deliver. We're substantially outside the range of our peers. And when did that happen? It didn't happen in the 50s and 60s when we really were um, an economic powerhouse without many rivals. It really started, we're the red line here, it really started in the 80s and perpetuated through the 80s and 90s. And a lot of this, um, by the way, came down to new um, technologies, new drugs, basically things that worked better Many of them only provide marginal benefit in terms of value to us, but we accepted them because we thought they were better, and we really didn't have to look at them carefully. Well, the reality is I think a lot of this decision-making, we're clearly borrowing from our children's futures in many regards in this, um, and a lot of decisions have to be made. I think from our standpoint in obstetrics, this, we're not going to fix this problem. Do you know where all the fix 
in the U.S. healthcare economic problem is end of life, as you probably know. The majority of money you spend in your lifetime is in the last six months. Who are the most powerful and effective people to make that change going forward? They are a subspecialty group of ours that is very small, poorly reimbursed, and not very empowered. But I think that um, this group I'm referring to are palliative physicians. They are underpaid, um, but they're the ones who can gap the expectation difference between the healthcare providers and end of life terminally ill patients. Terminally ill patients want to die in their living rooms without um, all of us surrounding them in intensive care for the most part. And a lot of it is poor expectation management in those last few months. Palliative physicians are among the best. It's not going to be us. And by the way, there is one more country out there that actually uh, makes more per capita uh, than the United States, or at least in terms of large countries, and it's Norway, small population in North Sea oil. In fact, they're a country like the Scandinavian countries in general that have very high expectation for their social services. They pay high taxes, um, at least in Sweden and Finland. Norway doesn't have to because of the oil situation. Um, but the reality is they spend less per capita in a system where they're high utilizers of health care. Um, these are data I'm presenting from my own institution. Um, just to give you some sense of what this looks like from the managerial standpoint, a lot of the goals in for all of our organizations is to continue to deliver cost per admission at a much lower rate than we have been. Our sense is that a lot of reimbursement is going to come down into Medicare levels, and in order to be viable in the future, one has to deliver care at a much lower cost, otherwise you're not going to survive. Um, the blue line represents the direction of uh, cost per case at my institution um, with just cost inflation over time. That was the trajectory we were on. We set a goal for ourselves to not only keep it flat, but to meet substantial reductions. We've been successful in the four years that I've been participating in reducing this. This is extremely painful. You guys know this because you're probably feeling it on your ends. What does this look like? It's people coming to you, can you, um, hey listen, in order to purchase epidural kits, can you live with this one? It's $5 cheaper per, and we do 12,000. Know, these are the kind of things you're presented with. Um, but the decisions aren't so simple, and I want to present you some examples of how that's done. This is also cutting housekeeping to the point where you see trash accumulating in the stairwells, stopping, and then adding one more back in. This is really difficult management, but it also reflects how easy it's been for us up until now. Going forward, we have to think. That's the challenge for us. So um, what are the cost effectiveness questions that come up for us? What are the ones you want to answer? There's this whole series of them. In fact, the best ones to answer are a lot of screening methodologies. You know, uh, anesthesiologists are not um, reimbursed to see a lot of patients in preoperative clinic, um, certainly not in the obstetric world. How can you model that easily? Should you be seeing every obese patient that comes your way? There are so many scre genetic screening tests that are out there, but almost all of them aren't really cost effective. When you think of some of the challenges that Scott Siegel was presenting yesterday with epidural fever, it seems like almost certainly you'll be able to identify perhaps some subpopulation that might be vulnerable for that. Is it something we should be screening for? You certainly see that in terms of coagulopathy management in a lot of um, obstetric patients. A lot of new drugs, new interventions, questions that came up in this weekend should you invest in a $40,000 viscoelastometer to help you manage more precisely your coagulopathy in bleeding patients? Is that um, a cost-effective decision to make? What about all the staffing decisions? If you're in a smaller community hospital and the, the hospital administration made a decision to actually pay an obstetrician, a laborist, to man your floor 24-7 because they perceive that there's benefits of that, does that make sense for our side of the house? Should the anesthesia team be staffed 24-7 with some kind of subsidy by the hospital? Does that make sense? All of these questions are out there, but you're going to see why some of them are easy to answer with this methodology, some of them are not. Um, as I described for you, comparative effectiveness is almost all of the domain of what we talk about in these types of meetings. Is it work better or not? Um, cost benefit is something, when you start thinking about um, addressing economic issues, most of them are really in this realm. That is, 
if I invest in this, over time does it save me money? Outcomes are purely in economic terms. Um, many of them come to break even analyses. As I just described, you should we buy a machine that may help us it may save cost over the next four years, it'll pay for itself. Those are, those are cost benefit analyses. The real rich analysis comes in what's called cost effectiveness analysis. It not only combines economic terms, but it adds health benefits. It's challenging to measure these things and you'll get some sense of that. Who is that? That's Milton Weinstein. That is the father of healthcare economic uh, analysis. So cost um, benefit, what are the information you need to make these? Well, the reason you can't answer a lot of questions on cost um, effectiveness is, or even in the cost benefit realm, is you don't have enough information. In fact, some of the limitations of this methodology in Valve, there are, there's a fair degree of uncertainty um, because there are so many measurements being compared and added together that in the end, um, if this were a clinical question, you almost certainly would reject it on the basis of a p-value over 0.05. Um, you'll see to some degree there's also a lot of uncertainty in how, in the, well, in the assumptions one makes about the healthcare benefits. All of these things make you skeptical when you begin to read this literature. That being said, I think we need to start somewhere. To some degree I view, when I think of clinical research and I think of my father was an academic physician, what he described as evidence to support certain decision making. In the 50s and 60s, it was really nowhere near the level of evidence that we would consider robust to make decisions. A lot of it's survey and opinion data, and this is what was called evidence. Um, in many respects, I view a lot of this analysis uh, in its nascent stage. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of um, imperfection in it. That being said, one has to start somewhere. Again, outcomes in the cost benefit range are how are dollars changed going forward in what is um, perhaps a mean with a confidence interval. Most of the perspective of a cost-benefit analysis is either from our view or the healthcare system's view. Are you saving money as a system? It might come in your, in the practitioner's realm, that is if you um, are sharing in some of the health, the consequence, the financial consequences of the decisions you're making. But in most cases, it's not. Um, how does this look? I'm going to provide two examples that are actually in a world of a clinical domain that's a little esoteric, but it's one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, external cephalic version. This is the management of breach presentation. Should you attempt to turn babies um, to avoid cesarean delivery? It is um, something that meets many of the criteria for cost effectiveness, cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis in that um, we have a fair amount of information about probabilities of improved clinical outcomes. It's very easy to calculate the financial, the incremental financial costs associated with this. Um, and I'll show you how it's done. In this specific one, I'll show you two examples. One of them is a cost benefit and purely an economic analysis of our participation in this procedure, should you do epidurals or spinal anesthetics for this. And I'll also present it to you with a broader qualitative um, analysis in, uh, with just should we be doing this in the first place, should obstetricians be engaging this. But those are the examples are used. I acknowledge they're a little esoteric, but part of the problem in this business is there's very few things, there's very few examples with an obstetric anesthesia that are easy to apply this to and that there's been work done in it. And fortunately the work done in it has been mostly by the Stanford team and by the moderator of this session, um, Brendan Carvalho. This was published, um, I think last year, Brendan, if I remember right. Well, first of all, you need a clinical decision outcome tree. And in breach, in management of breach presentation, it's, it's fairly simple, but this is what it looks like. Are you going to attempt to turn a baby or not? If you're going to do it, are you going to do an epidural? Are you successful or not? Should you reattempt it? Um, in the end, does the baby revert back to breach position? In the end, if you've been successful in turning the baby, do they end up laboring and being sectioned for arrest of dilation anyway? Um, but this is the decision tree. What are the probabilities? We actually know of it because we've had six randomized controlled trials in this realm. But note, there still is a range of probability that starts to add uncertainty to this equation and starts to create skepticism in the minds um, of us who are interpreting these results. But each of these, um, we know this from, um, well, if you put together the six trials that looked at neuraxial anesthetics in an attempt to improve labor, um, improve the success of versions, um, they've been published in a couple different forms. I present the one that was published in the Green Journal, 
actually this is probably the audience you most want to um, get this message to obstetricians to we may or may not as a community know about this intervention, but obstetricians are probably the ones who can affect this if it's on, uh, more if it's on their radar. Unfortunately, this was a good example of the lack of multidisciplinary approach to answering a question. Um, this was an all obstetrician team um, who published it in the um, Green Journal and they made a classic mistake in meta-analysis, specifically in combining heterogeneous groups. We knew at the time uh, we published our trial in 2009 that there was a very clear dose response effect in this realm. That is, if you did analgesic dosing for this procedure, you did not see a substantial benefit in terms of success of turning the baby. Whereas if you did a surgical anesthetic, either by form of spinal or a, a generously dosed epidural, that you did get a positive effect. Well, they showed in this forest plot that the likelihood of success of the procedure was uh, increased in all of these trials when you combine them, the analgesic ones and the anesthetic ones, but then gave a subsequent uh, forest plot that showed, but ultimately it doesn't change the cesarean delivery rate. And that's the message all obstetricians got in their lead highest impact journal. And the unfortunate question was, you really needed to throw out the analgesic ones and the conclusion for anesthetic dosing was it does reduce cesarean delivery rate. Um, what are the incremental costs of our participation in this? Um, this is one of two areas that sometimes you get some pushback by practitioners when they look at this. They look at this and immediately say, wait, these, these numbers look low to me. Well, most of the methodology in this is to use com very competitive market rates. For most uh, ec medical economic decisions, that's Medicare prices for um, many interventions. Um, that doesn't make sense, of course, in our world, but these are basically incremental costs of an anesthetic kit in our time. You're really adding uh, a very little money with our intervention, and that might give you some sense that perhaps this is undervaluing that. But just know all economic decisions are at these very competitive market rates. What are the different outcomes in this? The nice thing about this clinical example is that there are just a few ranges of possibilities that are looked at that probably are going to drive this outcome, what are the incremental costs if you get a version done, if you get it with us, if you go on to have a vaginal delivery, cesarean delivery, or if you have a bad complication such as you need an emergent cesarean and, and your baby might end up um, having consequences of that. Well, that's easy to model. Um, and the, the, ben the result of this was that, um, I guess just in looking at our overall contribution, is that 12% of the cost of ECV is, is us and 3% of the total cost of delivery um, in terms of our participation and aversion ends up being this. And the mean cost is that you probably save a couple hundred dollars with our participation. Um, the most valuable thing, when you look at as I described some of the uncertainty that's built in this, the most valuable thing is you identify pretty quickly in any of these analyses what are the drivers of cost. And it's very clear in the version venue that the ability and the increased success in doing the procedure with an anesthetic is the, is the cost driver. In fact, if you can increase, I'm sorry, decrease the likelihood of cesarean delivery by 11% or more, which that does seem to pan out with the surgical dosing, then almost certainly this is a cost-effective intervention. Um, but let's take it a step further. In fact, let's use the exact same example, although we'll maybe just talk about it in the context of should we be trying to flip babies at all. Um, but now we're adding in some global health utility information. What, um, what is the quality of life of an individual in each of these different pathways on that complex or relatively complex decision tree? And the outcomes here are not, do you save money? Is there a range of money you save? Um, and by the way, I'm going to back up, I think, here and show one more point that's probably worth making on this. Notice there's a confidence interval on the cost savings. $276 savings is the average savings. The confidence interval clearly crosses parity, as we would say, in a, in a comparativeness effectiveness study. In fact, you might reject it on the basis, you know, almost certainly we'd reject that there's any difference here. You look at things a little differently in turn, when you're looking at economic modeling. Um, 
although there's some argument around this, but in many circumstances, you're willing to accept a little bit more uncertainty if you know that there's a 90% chance, for example, that you may end up saving money on this and a 10% chance that it may be no different or you actually lose money. Those are decisions you feel a little bit more comfortable making in the economic realm than you do in the clinical realm, although I think there's a little bit of debate about that. Um, this is how you've seen this presented. This is an outcome in how many dollars are you spending per quality adjusted life year? And I'll show you a little bit of that and what that means. By the way, that is the, probably the second source of pushback in this for most um, intelligent practitioners. Um, and I'll show you some of that information. The analysis perspective for this is society. This is no longer patient, this is no longer you and I, this is no longer our hospital system. This is the assumption that we have a fixed amount of dollars in the US to spend on healthcare and we could rank all of the interventions, presumably in the ideal economic modeling world, from start to finish, and then maybe draw a line on those that we don't think are worth investing in. You know this, you've heard about this. This has been referred to as league tables. Um, the Oregon Health System 20 years ago decided that they were gonna use some system like this. People have a lot of strong feelings about this when it comes to end of life care. That being said, it's rational decision making, and for the most part for us in obstetric anesthesia, this isn't really life and death decision making. This is just some simple decisions about whether to um, implement new interventions or other practices that we are routinely questioning. By the way, this publication growth is exploding. You're gonna see more and more of this, and I think the real value is just to walk you through some of this methodology. The principal, um, the principal um, equation in cost effectiveness analysis modeling is the ICER, um, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. It just has cost on the numerator side and success of treatment on the downside, but note, that in the success of treatment now includes these broad measures of what the outcomes are. They're not just reduction in some complication. It has a lot to do with what's your recovery like from X procedure. Um, and oh, by the way, this is including cost of the patient's time and a lot of society costs that we never think about, lost employment time, we usually don't think that broadly in terms of our outcomes. The commonly accepted threshold for this, as I mentioned to you, is a second source of major pushback of intelligent practitioners. How on earth can you value a life at $50,000? One quality of adjusted life here. Don't get hung up on that. It's just a relative measure. It just allows you to actually rank a lot of different interventions. Um, and the value in itself maybe isn't as meaningful as many people place it when they first see this. So all of them, um, I have to look and see where the laser is on this. Here we go. Um, so a lot of the decisions fall into this graph of cost on the y-axis, effectiveness of the intervention on the x-axis. There's two domains you don't even have to think about. If something is more expensive but works worse, you reject it. If something is, um, I'm sorry, that was this, something is more expensive but doesn't work as well, you reject it. If something is cheaper and works better, you accept it. All of the decision making here is in these realms. Basically, yes, I know this is more effective, but is the additional cost I'm investing in it worth it? What are these things? These are all of these things I was kind of describing. New drugs, new interventions, is viscoelastometry something I should adopt? Well, it's all coming into here. Is it gonna fall on this side or that side of the line whether you accept it or reject it by this modeling? What's this? This is those painful decisions I was describing to you. This is someone shoving a new epidural kit at you with maybe a catheter that you think is inferior. And the questions really come down to, is it so much less in fear that it's not worth the substantial savings to the system? This is your new IV blood tubing that you've got that you think is inferior to what you got before. From a hospital administrator side, if they think the only out negative outcome of that is transient grumbling of you, it's accepted, by the way, um, as painful as that is. Um, the numerator va variables, as I described, you have this broader perspective than you've ever looked at. It's including a lot of impact on someone's time, but this is the way you look at this in this modeling broadly. Cost by employers, goodness, we've never really talked about that in some of this. Um, the incremental costs have some, a lot of um, methodology and standards around them. 
and it's easy to incorporate this in some of the models, but some of these data are a little bit hard to come by. But there are, there are a lot of um, average wage data out there per uh, gender and um, age that can be incorporated into these models. Um, but the healthcare consequence is probably the more interesting part of this model and is worth talking about a little bit before the end of this talk. Um, quality adjusted life years come into, um, it basically talks about differential survival, but I think in the model I'm describing, differential morbidity is really the more relevant one. And how it affects, if you've had a vaginal delivery or a cesarean delivery, if you've had com com complication, what are the next 12 weeks of your life looking like from a patient's perspective? Um, well, I mean, the health utility range, zero, you're dead, one, you're in optimal health, and everything else is in between as a fraction thereof. You can look at a lot of different domains in this, a lot of domains that may be um, a little softer than what we're typically thinking about with um, serious morbidities, but this is what it's like to recover from a lot of uh, healthcare interventions um, that perhaps might be the difference when you're the patient, you recognize these, but when you're the provider, you might overlook them. I'm gonna show you, um, one tool for measuring that called the Euroqual, specifically the Euroqual 5D, looking at these five domains specifically. And this was the one used in the example I'm gonna show you. Um, you basically get a questionnaire as a patient and you answer the, uh, questions on these five domains really in three categorical answer responses. It seems actually somewhat unsophisticated when you look at it. The power is when you pair answers from individuals with broad groups of the population um, and get a sense of differential values on these. Um, clearly it incorporates a time multiple over each of the next few days, weeks. Some of the weakness in this is that you probably can get much more granularity if you ask people on every single day what this looks like, but usually um, the intervals are something that's a little less granular. Um, this is what one of these, this is the EuroQual 5D questionnaire. It's pretty simple, but again, the, the power of this is pooling it with uh, population data on how people answer these questions in a variety of settings and a variety of demographics. <coughs> um, as I described to you, this cost effectiveness threshold of 50,000 per quality adjusted use is the most commonly described in the literature. Where does it come from? It came from some early papers uh, looking at cost effectiveness of uh, frequency of dialysis. And it's been adopted as a commonly used standard since the 90s moving forward. You'll see some that use different ones. In fact, that doesn't even make any sense to be using the same value threshold that we did 20 years ago. But in many respects, this is just relative valuing. Um, and I don't need, think you need to put so much weight specifically on that number, but you'll see why, if you have questions about why that's used, that number specifically. Um, well, to use two examples from the Stanford team, and I'm clearly just pandering to the moderator of this session, uh, Brendan Carvalho, um, but this was the other, other paper on the subject of version. But this was the question of, should we have been doing this in the first place? It has nothing to do with the answer about whether anesthesiologists should participate in this at all. Um, the Euroqual 5D data looks at the two outcomes that are primarily used, vaginal delivery and cesarean delivery. Looks a little clunky actually, doesn't it? If you look at 12 weeks out, both groups are back to perfect health with a, um, a utility score of 1.0, and their immediate first few days, weeks thereafter, there's differential quality of life scoring based on the use of this tool. As I said, probably reality is a little bit more granular what you see there, but, um, and this is some of the reason that there's a little bit of pushback that this looks a little unsophisticated in some respects, but nonetheless, it's an attempt to answer some questions that are important for us. There's also more outcomes here that we didn't talk about, some of the adverse events and morbidity. Um, what is the value of attempting to flip a baby in the first place without us? It's, a, it's got a quality, an ICER of 7,900, well below this accepted standard of 50,000, a very cost-effective inter intervention. In fact, I put on here also, there is an organization that's out there that accumulates all of these cost-effectiveness paper and scores them on the quality of the work they did. Um, and it's called the Cost Effectiveness Analysis Registry. It's run, run out of Tufts, and it's a source of a lot of information that you can pick up answers to these. Um, they define standards, uh, and th these are the standards they use to measure many of these if you're just doing it right. It's really a peer review. This is their site uh, on the website that you can go to, Cost Effectiveness Analysis Registry. Um, and I think the last question I want to address in this, is there publication bias in this sector? Almost certainly, 
as you can see uh, in this publication. If you uh, do an analysis and it clearly demonstrates cost effectiveness by this methodology, then you're going to be quick to take this to publication. As an editor, you're probably going to be quick to publish it. If something has a clear, uh, uh, you're in a clear range where something is not cost effective, um, you're probably quicker to publish those. But look at this whole domain in the middle, you know, between 50 and 100,000. Those are the ones that are on the fence, and those are probably a little bit less exciting or maybe a little bit less definitive in your conclusion and less likely to publish. But I just want you to be wary of that. What are some numbers that are out there? Well, there's very little published in, uh, in anesthetic practice, actually. These are just some obstetric icers that are out there and published. And some of them are actually kind of provocative and not entirely um, without um, some of their controversies. Should we be inducing patients at 41 weeks to avoid some of the complications that develop there afterward? I think at dinner someone was talking about uh, a 43-week patient coming to them and the risks associated with that. Should you use pneumatic compression stockings in low-risk patients who, um, who are coming for cesarean delivery to avoid venous thromboembolism? Well, you know, obviously there's other ways to avoid that, but just answering that specific question, um, you come up with a favorable um, answer. But as you look at a lot of screening methodology, things that seem to make a lot of sense for us, they start to walk into this range of things that are less and less cost effective. Um, for example, I think you can really see not just examining and screening patients for H the presence of HIV and whether you need to alter your obstetric decision making based on that, but the decision to actually culture every patient um, for this um, and use it in your decision making acts to be a very unfavorable icer because probably the impact is not as substantial um, on outcomes as one might think. I think the one for me is you know, framing elective repeat cesarean versus like First of all, I think I would have flipped that around and looked at it from the other perspective. But I just want to go out there and just show you some examples of ones and dig into these if you're on, if you've got some questions about them. Um, to conclude, I think uh, there's no question we have challenges in terms of economics and healthcare these days. I don't think the primary drivers are an obstetric anesthesia, they're end of life decisions. That being said, we probably need to be a little bit more thoughtful. We probably are going to be expected to be a little bit more thoughtful going forward in making decisions whether to adopt practices. Almost certainly you're going to be reading more about this and hearing more about this spoken about at meetings going forward. Thank you very much.